couple of years ago, just after the pandemic lockdown had ended, I read a book which for me spoke into that time very powerfully and has done ever since. The Winter Halt by the Canadian writer Anne Michaels, some of you may have read some of her books, uh, takes place in part in Warsaw in the immediate aftermath of World War II. So I want to read just an extract, a short extract from, from that just now. When ground is too frozen for the digging of graves, says, said Lucian, the dead wait in these winter vaults. There is always a dignity to these buildings, whether made of brick or stone, with expensive brass fittings, or just a humble shed. Okay, I'm getting some there. I think that was my slide, Paul. <laughs> because they are built with respect for those who will lie within their walls. But in times of war or siege, she continued, when there are too many civilians for such vaults, other makeshift shelters must be found. In Warsaw, during the bitter winter of 1944-45, the dead rested together in root cellars, in mind-blasted gardens, amid the rubble of the streets under sheets of newspaper. During the siege of Leningrad, along the road to the Piskarevsky Cemetery, thousands were heaped, so high the ice encased dead formed a tunnel through which one passed in terror. Crowded trolley cars stood immobile in the ice and snow, tombs that could not be moved until the spring. The dead were wound tenderly in shawls, towels, rugs, curtains, wrapping paper bound with twine. In cold apartments, Bodies were placed in the bath, left in bed, laid on tables. They clustered the pavement, doused with turpentine. In the 30 degree below zero weather, the ground was, like the hymn says, hard as iron. And a mass grave could only be moved, only be made by dynamiting. The frozen bodies were then thrown, clinking together, into the pit. The winter dead wait, says, said Lucian, for the earth to relent and receive them. They wait in histories of thousands of pages where the word love is never mentioned. <clears throat> Two things struck me forcibly on reading this. The first was the sense that for many, during the worst of the pandemic, their loved ones were still in a kind of winter vault, waiting for the proper funeral rites and remembrances to be performed. The proper honouring of the dead is so important from generation to generation of human existence and we still play a crucial role in that. And the second thing that struck me was that it's hard for us in the UK to really understand the deep trauma that not just the Second World War but much of the 20th century caused in Eastern Europe from the Soviet famines of the 1930s, when an estimated 8 million peasant farmers died of starvation in Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture, the majority of them being Ukrainian, a time known as the Holodomor, 
to the occupation of Poland and the Warsaw Ghetto, the Holocaust to the Battle of Stalingrad with its two million casualties, and the siege of Leningrad when a million civilians died. In fact, the whole Eastern Front, where 30 million people lost their lives, we can barely comprehend or imagine the scale and the suffering, which is largely overlooked in our narratives of World War II and of who won the war. Of course, all of this struck me so forcibly because as I was reading, Russian tanks were rolling across the border into Ukraine. The horror of what was happening there is unspeakable. And amidst the many atrocities, one in particular I found especially distressing. It is that during this assault, and actually since 2014, Russia has forcibly transferred almost 20,000 Ukrainian children to areas under its control, assigned them Russian citizenship, forcibly adopt them, adopted them into Russian families, and created obstacles to their reunification with their parents and homeland. The United Nations has stated that these deportations constitute war crimes. Not that we should need the UN to tell us that. <clears throat> the acute fear and distress caused to these children is almost beyond imagining. Sadly, this kind of forced removal of children from their parents is not new. Neither has it ever worked out well in the many places it has been done, usually in some kind of colonialist, white supremacist context, among indigenous communities in Canada and the USA, for the stolen generation in Australia, in Greenland, among the Inuit, in Israel, among the Yemeni community, in South America at the time of the Juntas. It's an acute reminder that of all the victims of war, children, the innocent ones, are also the most vulnerable. And just when you thought things for children couldn't get any worse, now there is Gaza in what is the most tragic of wars. Perhaps you remember the name Hind Rajab. She was a six-year-old Palestinian child who was trapped under fire in Gaza City, hiding inside her uncle's car, surrounded by the dead bodies of her relatives her uncle, her aunt, and five cousins. They had set off from their home earlier in the day, having been told by the Israeli army to evacuate to a supposedly safer area. But their vehicle was shelled by an Israeli tank, killing everyone in it except for Hind and her 15-year-old cousin Leon. Leanne called the Palestinian Red Crescent Society for aid, crying that the tank was now right next to them. Leanne was killed by machine gun fire while she was still on the phone to the dispatcher. When the Red Crescent team phoned back, it was Hinge who answered, her voice almost inaudible, drowned in fear, it soon became clear that she was the only survivor in the car and that she was still in the line of fire. For three hours, Rana, the Red Crescent operator, stayed on the line with her while her team appealed to the Israeli army to allow their ambulance to access the location. Everything went quiet. Her, 
pleas for someone to rescue her ended when the phone line was cut amidst the sound of more gunfire. Several days later, paramedics from the Palestinian Red Crescent Society managed to reach the area which had previously been closed off as an active combat zone. They found the black Kaya car Hint had been travelling in. Its windscreen and dashboard smashed to pieces, bullet holes scattered across the side. Hind was among the six bodies found inside the car, all of which showed signs of gunfire and shelling. A few metres away were the remains of another vehicle, completely burned out, its engine spilling onto the ground. This, the Red Crescent said, was the ambulance sent to fetch Hind. Its crew, Yusuf al Zaino and Ahmed al Madun, were killed when the ambulance was bombed by Israeli forces just as they reached their destination. The Red Crescent told the BBC that it had taken several hours to coordinate access with the Israeli army in order to send paramedics to Hind. Recordings of Hind's conversation with the call operator, which were shared publicly by the Red Crescent, sparked a campaign to find what had happened to her. Hind's mother told the BBC that she was waiting for her daughter any moment any second. The Red Crescent got the coordination. They brought the green light. On arrival, the crew had confirmed that they could see the car where Hind was trapped and that they could see her. The last thing that the Red Crescent heard was continuous gunfire. You'll see that there's a picture here. Uh, this is a picture of my granddaughter. <coughs> Just a picture to remind you what a six-year-old little girl looks like. A six-year-old little girl who, terrified, asking for people to come and help her, asking for people to come and rescue her. I cannot tell you how distressed I was by this story back in the, in the early spring. It pierced my soul so that during Holy Week I could not hear the Good Friday narratives without being almost blinded by fury. How can we listen devotedly and piously to the account of the three-hour passion of a man 2,000 years ago while remaining utterly indifferent at a global level to the three-hour passion of a six-year-old little girl who was killed for no other reason than fun, because people could. <coughs> Did you not feel the soft baby skin press to your cheek? The small arms clinging round your neck like ivy on a post. The small weight asleep on your chest in the night and know that this was the meaning of the incarnation. This sweet, damp flesh. These small bones. Christ child. Human. The whole universe in her eye. A few nights listening to the breathing of a sleeping child could have answered a lot of your endlessly tortured questions about the doctrine of man. You might have adopted your breathing to the heartbeat of God lying beside you. And others might have killed less babies. War is hell. Everywhere and at all times. 
we sacrifice our children and young people. We fetishize it as entertainment and a kind of marker of masculinity. And we create genera generation after generation of traumatized people. I cannot imagine what the long-term consequences of such brutal violence against civilians, against children, is doing to young Israeli soldiers and to young soldiers, to child soldiers across the world. The environmental damage caused by war and preparations for war is incalculable. You may know or you may not know that the, um, the carbon emissions of the world's militaries are not counted when countries are counting their carbon emissions. So it's like a whole kind of hidden uh, cost. I don't really mean any disrespect to soldiers who are mostly just doing what they are ordered to by old men. I recently read something by Richard Rohr, the American Franciscan. He said, Christianity is a lifestyle, a way of being in the world that is simple, non-violent, shared and loving. However, we made it into an established religion and all that goes with that and avoided the lifestyle change itself. One could be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish and vain in most of human history and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Lord and Saviour. The world has no time for such silliness anymore. The suffering on earth is too great. I cannot conceive of a circumstance in which I could worship a God who demanded the killing of an innocent child. And indeed, the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah marks an important transition. For the God of Abraham stayed his hand and forbid the forbade the slaughter. No longer should human beings be offered up as sacrifice. It's a powerful story of absolute trust and a most absolute warning against idolatry. And it's a prohibition of human sacrifice and a warning against idolatry that has been much lauded but little heeded. During World War I, the war poet Wilfred Owen reminds us of how the old man refused to hear the angel and slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one. prohibition of human sacrifice is for people in the Judeo-Christian tradition. The first great clarion call to abandon the myth of redemptive violence. This notion that hurting and killing people is good for them has exerted and continues to exert huge power. It authorizes the beating of children, often by very religious people, for their own good, the subordination of women because they are weaker, the oppression of whole peoples because they are inferior or uncivilized or underdeveloped. It authorizes occupation, imperialism, colonialism and neo-colonialism. This myth saves people from having to engage with the central humanitarian value that people are not expendable as a means to an end. And it leaves fundamental abuses of power unchallenged. That is why it is necessary. It raises violence to the status of a virtue. It justifies hateful and unjust means. It instrumentalizes young people as weapons. It serves the killers not the killed. They held up a stone and I said stone. Smiling, they said stone. They showed me a tree. I said tree. Smiling, they said tree. 
They shed a man's blood. I said, blood. Smiling, they said, paint. They shed a man's blood. I said, blood. Smiling, they said, paint. Writing in the aftermath of last month's Harpine riots, an academic psychologist suggested that rather than feeling destructive impulses, most of us feel a natural impulse to help others and alleviate suffering. This explains why so many people were appalled by the cruelty and brutality of the rioters and felt the impulse to counter it with positive action. He attributes this altruistic impulse to people's sense of connection to each other and to the world. But a minority of people are severely disconnected. They exist in a state of psychological isolation, cut off from other people and the world around them. They don't feel empathy for anyone beyond a narrow circle of family and friends and others who share their ideology and ethnicity. Disconnected and connected people perceive the world in completely different ways. To a disconnected group, asylum seekers and immigrants may seem like enemies who are responsible for society's problems. It's easy to wind disconnected people up with lies and scapegoating. To the connected group, Asylum seekers and immigrants are fellow human beings who deserve respect and compassion. Connected people are able to empathize with asylum seekers, aware that many of them have undergone severe trauma in their home countries. They share a fundamental interconnection of being. There's a strong link between disconnection and negative childhood experiences. The most severely disconnected people, such as serial killers and fascist dictators, often emerge from abusive, traumatic childhoods. Other disconnected people suffer a prolonged lack of affection and attention during early childhood. For privileged disconnection, eh, for privileged disconnected people, there are plenty who have made a hypothesis that this may be the result of being sent away to boarding school at a very early age. Others emerge from hyper-masculine environments where empathy and emotion are seen as weak and undesirable. That doesn't mean that everyone who emerges from these kind of backgrounds becomes cruel and brutal, but it increases the likelihood As you may have noticed uh, from what I said this morning, I find it deeply concerning that right-wing white nationalists so often claim to be upholding the Christian faith. It seems to me a travesty. But that claim asks difficult questions of us. My reformed Christian tradition is one that emphasizes the importance of citizenship as an integral part of faith. It has always inhabited the public square quite comfortably, sometimes in the interest of its own pure and therefore sectarian identity, sometimes in a more enlightened, do as you would be done by way. But it has always been at its most faithful when it has followed the anointed Jesus outside holiness into identification with the not us, the minority, the supplicants, the dispossessed. And as a member of the Iona community, with an explicit commitment to peacemaking, I am well aware of the ambiguous nature of our scriptures, our liturgies, our histories, our religious language, our practices, our theologies. Violence and exclusion are woven through them like scarlet threads, as they are through all of life, 
these threads, as much as the faith in which they are embedded, continue to shape our modern world and the dominant ideological maps in both church and state. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? But even the act of interpreting and answering that question, of seeking to unpick the threads of violence in Christianity, has its own implicit violence. It uproots and disturbs. It makes people homeless. It carries bereavement within it. And we don't always account for the tears of relocation. As we attempt to live by the map of nonviolence, we are aware of our complicity in violence at every level, from our own small deceits and betrayals to our involuntary collusions. It's a great poem by Alice Walker, the author of The Colour Purple. Love is not concerned with whom you pray or where you slept the night you ran away from home. Love is concerned that the beating of your heart should kill no one. I cannot say that the beating of my heart will kill no one. As we attempt, there are times when I feel so enmeshed in the web of violence, so aware of its implications, so despairing of the Christian community as a, mo a model of non-violence and reconciliation that it seems impossible to break free. And I hear once again the question of Jesus to me, who do you say that I am? What am I holding on to in my commitment to non-violence? I want to say a little about how God comes to me. Speaking personally, God has never come to me through a proposition, a theology, a doctrine, or a dogma. Hope and a resurrection have quickened in me, in the body and in the world. Deliverance, healing from harm, reconciliation have been always and only through the word made flesh. Through my senses, in the infinite beauty of created things, in silence and songs and psalms and poems and the testimony of others, in touch and tenderness, in companionship and food and rain and sun, God comes to me when I am swimming in the sea. Perhaps this is simply a pre-conscious memory of the womb but I think God is a more stylish way to put it. So I'm holding on to the word made flesh and the revaluing of the body, and that includes our physical, natural interconnectedness. Build me a bridge over the stream to my neighbor's house, where he is standing in dungarees in the fresh morning. Or oh, ring of snowdrops, spread wherever you want, and you also, blackbird, sing across the fences. My neighbour, if the rain falls on you, let it fall on me also, from the same black cloud that does not recognise gates. I remember once being at the nuclear base at Fans Lane with some of the saints for a peace demonstration, and something extraordinary happened, which Jan such Picard, who I know she's Methodist, but she may be known as And And she wrote this great poem about it. We shared communion at the gates of Faz Lane, one of the places in a broken world where breaking bread and drinking bitter wine is most relevant. We shared it to remember security, not of barbed wire and missiles, <laughs> but of God's love that risks all and gives life. We shared in a warm circle of believers. But later, when we sat down on the cold road, we found that the bread and the cup had escaped, 
and were still out there in the crowd, being shared carefully among people of all kinds. This paradox of pain and promise being passed from hand to hand in a broken world. Somehow in a place of great violence, a different kind of space came into being. <coughs> the Holy Spirit, unexpected, unpredictable, uncontrollable, came among us in the power of non-violence, as the Spirit does when we hold the space for us. <coughs> so I'm holding on to the promise and the power and the peace of the Spirit. The memory of that which is intolerable to us is remembered in Christ's body, in which is named all the violence of the world. But our communion is not in the memory of suffering. Our communion is in the hope of transformation, of new life, of blessing and sharing and laughter and delight. Our communion is in the feast even if the feast is outside the gate of a nuclear base. So I'd like you, I think in the, in the 15 or 20 minutes we have before we break for dinner, uh, to think about the question, how does God come to you? Uh, and then um, share that in 